The IMF, meanwhile, said the worst is yet to come for the global economy, warning that Britain faces high inflation for longer than similar economies. Perhaps Liz Truss needs a word with my next guest. Joining me is the billionaire entrepreneur John Caldwell, alongside author and journalist Jenny Cleveland, and talk TV political editor Kate McCann. Welcome to all your stellar panel, if ever there was one. <laughs> John Caldwell, great to see you. Um, see as you. one of the richest, most successful people in the country, what on earth do you make of this basket case of a few weeks we've had with the economy? Well, it's not just a few weeks, it's a few years, unfortunately, because all the wrong things were done right at the start of the pandemic. And there should have been a lot, a lot of different actions taken by Rishi Sunak, first of all. So all of this crisis started way back then. And, of course, the pandemic was a huge challenge to overcome, but there was lots of ways of managing it more shrewdly than we did. And those mistakes have now added to the inflation, which is, of course, also caused by the Ukraine situation and the hyperinflation of energy prices. So the whole lot has come to, together as a storm which has not been settled down by Liz Truss. Well, she's poured, she's poured a lot of uh, fuel onto the fire Absolutely. with this mini-budget. I mean, it, man, many economists I talk to think she's talking complete nonsense and quasi quarting that this idea that you can get growth, growth, growth by unleashing all these massive tax cuts without yeah. actually any way of funding them, yeah. they think is a complete disaster. I mean, I agree. With your, you, you agree I, with that? No, I, I agree with that. That's not to say I'm, uh, I've ever been against borrowing more money, but I wanted to borrow more money to invest in the economy, to mm. grow GDP. If you only borrow the money to put into people's pockets and rely on that feeding through mm. and creating growth, it's not going to work because all it'll do is create inflation. And, of course, that's where we are now. We're in a de desperate situation. Well, I don't care if they're Tories, if they're Labour, if they're a Lib Dem Labour pack. I don't care. Actually, <clears throat> what I care about is their ability to navigate us through incredibly difficult times. Mm. And what I really object to is it seems to have been Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng almost on their own, without any conversation with their cabinet even, mm. about these key uh, factors of the mini-budget, which has now turned disastrously wrong. I didn't vote for these two to do this. Mm. Nobody did. Yeah. Um, they, they don't have a mandate to behave in the way they're behaving. No, it's, it's extremely frustrating, but I'm frustrated more in the long term because, because I put in a plan to the government in March 2020 when I saw exactly what was going to happen as a result of the pandemic. I first of all said nobody should be substantially worse off. Mm. Rishi got that wrong and made people substantially better off in, in a large sector of people and then they made other people a lot worse off. So he got all that wrong. But I also put in what I call Cordwell Pandemic Recovery, which was a methodology of making Britain boom in the long term. And the central piece of that was to set up an enterprise zone for inward investment from all the countries in the world on environmental technology and grow what I call the Silicon Valley of the environment in the UK. Mm. And that would have provided a long-term income stream in, in a really desperately needed sector well, one in of the, the environment. One of the things the markets hate is unpredictability. Obviously, a massive unpredictable thing is the war in Ukraine. And you have a personal interest in this. You've actually taken in a Ukrainian family. Mm. First of all, what made you do that? And what's it been like having this family live with you? Well, I, 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 I thought it was absolutely horrendous when Putin... Um, uh, inv invaded. And I think NATO, in NATO incidentally made a massive mistake there. We should have sent troops in, protected the Ukraine borders, and then leave it to Pu Putin if he wanted to create a world war. Not be now on the defensive all the time and letting innocent Ukraine people get slaughtered. So I think that was a colossal mistake in all of this. Um, I wanted to help out as much as I possibly can. So right at the beginning, I went on uh, social media and looked for a Ukraine family. Uh, and I got a, a mother and son who were desperate. They were, they were desperately emotionally uh, damaged and just wanted safety. And the husband and, and father's on the front line, I think. Yeah, and, and of course, they are now living a life, um, a, a very pleasant life with me, where everything's provided and they've got lovely grounds, a lovely life, but they've got this compelling cloud of what's happening mm. back home, mm. what's happening to her husband, what's happening to all her relatives and friends, and what's happening to her homeland. And, and she bursts into tears quite regularly, as you'd naturally expect, because mm. she, doesn't, she doesn't know. None of us know. So, it, I mean, it's a tragic situation. 
Um, well, good so... for you for doing that. Um, one thing you said is that as part of the battle over energy, for example, that the British public should rally now and start to conserve individual quantities of energy. Why do you feel that's important? Well, it, that's a minor step, and it's been blown slightly out of proportion, but I still think that is a really good thing to do because we've got very high energy prices. When I was a kid, like a lot of people of my age, we lived in houses that were freezing cold, no heating hardly at all, and so on. Now, I'm not suggesting we go back to that, but what we can all do is reduce our energy consumption, which is great for the environment, and will reduce... So how are you doing? I mean, obviously, you're a very wealthy guy. You've got a lot of electricity. What are you doing? Well, I, pre I preach to people that they should do this and take measures to cut energy consumption, so I'm doing it myself, and I've switched my heating off at home. I just have my kitchen warm, mm -hmm. my bedroom, when it gets to freezing temperatures, I'll put a little bit of heat in the bedroom, but I'm, I'm, I'm practising what I preach because I don't want to be hypocritical about it. So even though financially it makes no difference <laughs> to me whatsoever, I just think I do my bit and lead from the front as I always have done. Jenny? I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, John Gulwell, switching gears a bit. King Charles III, the coronation will be on Saturday, May the 6th. It's around the bank holiday there. Um, th there's a, a lot of reports that they may try and slim it down, that rather than the big four-hour coronation that we saw for the Queen, his mother, that for him and his own Queen, Camilla, it may be a shortened version, maybe an hour or so, and less pomp and pageantry. I've got to say, I'm in two minds about this. I understand the optics in the middle of a cost-of-living crisis. But I also looked at what happened at the Queen's funeral and thought, my God, we showed the world what we can do when we put on this kind of thing. And that was a very sad occasion. Now we have a chance for a, a glorious celebration of our new monarch. Is it right to skimp? I mean, you, you live like a king yourself. <laughs> I've, been to, I've been to your place. I mean, Buckingham Palace looked like a shoebox. But um, should we just go for it and say, you know what? Actually, this is what we do better than anybody else. We should, because the pomp and ceremony is something that we do brilliantly well. It creates a lot of revenue for Britain uh, for, through tourism. Uh, the monarchy have been, the key people in the monarchy have been exceptionally good. The Queen is probably the greatest, not probably, is the greatest monarch that's ever lived and probably ever will live. And I think King Charles has done a great job in lots of areas of the environment and architecture and so on. And I think he'll be a pretty good king as well. Mm. And I think we should celebrate that and show the world that we can celebrate it in spite of the rather difficult circumstances we're in at the moment. This is what I think. Jenny, I presume you think the complete opposite, do you? Well, I don't think... The, I, I think there's a delicate balancing act. I think we live now in a digital age where people's attention spans are a lot shorter. Mm. I think four hours might be a bit much. You could make one hour uh, very sensational. I also think, you know, the coronation... <laughs> it's not a reality TV show. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, people, it's a coronation of our monarch. Same... John, quick plug for your book. Mm. Title? Love, pain, money. Which has brought you more pleasure? Love, pain, <laughs> well, or money? Well, uh, I think I'm a masochist, so, so, so probably the, the pain. pain. <laughs> probably the pain. But the pain and the love go together, don't I, they? I've the not read your book yet, but I want to because you, you actually, I, I think you're an absolutely brilliant example of a self-made success story in this country. We should be very proud to have you, and I, I'm looking forward to reading it. I think you all speak common sense, which is a massively overlooked virtue.